All right, that looks like it's going. <clears throat> so, I showed you something good, something bad, there's something ugly. Now, this part is not a power supply, uh, despite the high current barrier strip there. It is just a panel, or a, a uh, panel mount voltage current meter that I picked up off eBay for like 10 bucks. Um, and it also has a DC-DC converter. Oh my. DC-DC converter for, uh, so that you can plug USB into it and charge phones or whatever. Uh, so I say it's ugly. It, it did exactly what I intended it to do. It's just ugly because if you see the sheen on it, I don't know how well that'll come out, um, but that sheen uh, is, is this two-part two part epoxy resin stuff. That stuff. Uh, there you go. So you can get it at a hardware store. Um, holds really, really well. Uh, this thing is probably never coming apart because I put it all together um, and then I assembled it. I'm sorry, I assembled it, and then I, I, I put the resin on it. And my idea behind this was I wanted to be able to, you know, to have it take some abuse and withstand it. Um, more than that, though, um, I wanted to see what would happen to the transparency. That's why it's in transparent ABS. Uh, to see how far in the epoxy ingresses. So if, if you... If you've dealt with 3D printers at all, you, you, you kind of figure that the parts they produce are porous. Uh, they will always be lower density than the pure plastic that you melt and cast. Um, there's a lot of airspace in it, in other words. Um, but I was I was seeing how if I could use the surface tension in the epoxy to fill that airspace and make a make a more sturdy part. So I figure I was trying to make a, a, a I was trying to 3D print a frame for a resin cast. Um, these bolts are not countersunk on purpose because this part was intended to be made into this one. And this is a bracket for uh, there we go. This is a bracket for a power or a, for a uh, uh, two farad 12 volt supercapacitor. Um, and the countersinks are present here, so I just I just use these screws. Um, and and I prefer to use coarse threaded screws in the plastic. Uh, this was still meant to be screwed into metal. Um, but the countersink is right in there. And there's almost no play in there, maybe a millimeter's worth of play total. Um, so that bolts to that, and then that Velcros or, or gets strapped otherwise to the supercapacitor so that this just hangs off of there and, and allows me to plug in USB devices and read the, read the power running through the thing. Um, the meter supports up to 100 amps, uh, but uh, it, it's it's the the largest range meter I have. Um, you can see that I only did a couple of a couple of layers of solid infill um, before it started doing the, doing the honeycomb. But if if you'll notice that this these two uh, regions that are probably showing up a little bit differently even on the video um, are the the rear of the current sense resistor. Uh, so the resistor is mounted there. There's a switch. The panel's here, and the DC-DC converter is mounted probably under here, right under the switch. It's real subtle. It's even more subtle than the resistors, but you'll notice that there's extra layering added around the switch. So where I, you'll notice I didn't use a washer. So wherever wherever I'm going to put that kind of a structure that risks ripping the the infill or the, ripping the solid infill, I'll I'll add more solid infill in, in the uh, in the slicer to those areas. Um, I, I usually prefer to let the slicer do that by setting max and min layers and then use, you know, scaling my model with that in mind. Uh, it's a little more fragile, but um, it, it does make the process easier. So uh, this, this part came out pretty good. The way I do countersinks, let's and bring this one back. This is, uh, this is also around the time I started using plastic savers, so that's, that's the only purpose of those hexagons. This part is, you know, also transparent ABS, and there's almost no warp in it. So by the time I printed this, I, I, I had learned a couple of things about ABS and how to work with it. The plastic saver added to that effect, uh, like reduced the warp. Um, the density on this part is much lower than the, than the, the, uh, the bad part that I showed you earlier. Um, and I also curved the corners. So all of those things, the, the corners, I, I kind of conceptualized the corner radius as being uh, like the willingness to warp is analogous to electrical corona, if, if you've ever dealt with high voltages and whatnot. 
the sharper the corner, the more tendency there is to warp at the point. So by curving them like that, you you uh, you it sticks to the bed a little bit better. Now the way I do these countersinks, and I don't know if that's going to come out on the video, but this is basically the bolt that I used. Um, it's a little bit longer than this, the ones that are installed, but it's the it's you know it's the same in principle. It's the same same. It's a different axial width, but it's the same threading and the same width of the head. So um, I start with the model of the, of the bolt. And I will make a cylinder that is only. Uh, let me get a better pointer. There we go. I start with a cylinder that is only up to the threading, so I'll, I'll go all the way to the bolt head, and then I will size that appropriate to my bolt. Now, my printer's tolerance is 0.4 millimeter. This is a circle, so I should, if I wanted to be, you know, if I wanted to just be able to drop a screw in there with no threading. I ought to take the width of the threading plus 0.8 millimeters and it should come out to you know just a light press and it will it will settle in. Now I, di I didn't really want to do that. Um, I wanted it to thread. So what you do is and this 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 is kind of subtle. Um, if you if you want to be real scientific about it, you you grab the thread depth for this for this kind of a bolt uh, and then you'd subtract from that um, because the plastic is layered. It's really, really easy to thread it in this orientation. These, the, the, uh, this was the bed contact side, by the way, right here. Um, it's really easy to thread it in this orientation because the bolt threading naturally grips into that, those layers. It's also easier to tear it. <laughs> so you gotta be careful of that. All of those factors come into play as you're, as you, as you're uh, making holes that you intend on threading something into. But these holes I did not want to thread these um, the, these are these are, are are not so tightly modeled I just I took the size that I had for the for the part that was going to ex going to accept and grip the threading and I just extruded it out a little bit wider than that so there's there's not it still grips but it's not it's not a solid fit um, uh, so you, you got your cylinder up to your threading um, at that point in blender go into object mode and then Highlight the face, that you, one of the end faces. Um, hit E to extrude, and then drag the extrusion up for the the, the width of the the count or the depth of the countersink that you want. And a little bit of a caveat: if you only do the 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 width of the bolt head, and then you embed it in a part like this one, where the countersink has to rise higher, than, much higher than the bolt head, like twice as high in this case. Let's, let's see how big that is. That's probably. Yeah, it's more than twice as high as the bolt head. So I usually, I don't even bother measuring the depth axially of the bolt head. I just extend it way out, way, well further than I know that I'll need, so that whatever I put in the way, I can still access the bolt. Um, so once you have that, you should have, you should have two cylinders of equal diameter and a seam running through one that corresponds to where your threading ends. After that, um, hit A a couple of times to make sure that you have nothing selected. Go into face mode, and you can either you can either select one face and hit Shift G, and then you'll have an option to select similar by area. So that will that will get you all of the walls. Uh, but the way I do it usually is just I, I hit C and then I group select with with the the wall or Z turned off so that I, I get a wireframe render. Um, and the reason I do it, I usually model with in wireframe mode is so that I can access vertices and edges and faces that are behind the thing that I'm that is otherwise blocking my view. So um, after you have all those faces selected, you're going to want to you're going to want to uh, again in the edit pane, um, you'll have an option to select where scaling and rotation is done from, whether it be individual object centers, uh, the median point. Uh, or the 3D cursor, and there's one other option, I think. But in this case, I did the, mid, the median point. And suppose this was the z-axis. I would then extrude again and immediately hit escape just to get the extra... I, I need those extra vertices in there so that I get a right angle and not a, not a cone. Um, without doing anything else, scale S and then shift G. And what that will do is that now, when you do your scaling operation, you will be adjusting the width of the top half of the cylinder and nothing else. Um, so adjust that to taste. Uh, again, make sure to account for tolerances because I, I like to have my countersinks, you know, 
tight tolerance, but that's that's pretty tight. It's tight enough. Um, uh, tight enough for this case. These parts were, were kind of tests, uh, which is why they're not in use. Um, but yeah, account for your width, and you, you should get a nice bolt countersink, and then after you have your bolt, you're satisfied with it, you can do the modifier, uh, the array modifier, to make many of them, uh, and then space them out according to your, to your project plan. So that's all for that part.